Welcome to today's masterclass, which is exploring Iago's motiveless malignity. So the idea of these masterclasses is that this will give you a more academic grounding in some of the bigger concepts and ideas within the texts, and you will then be able to go and use that to inform your own analysis and ideas of specific elements. So today we're going to look at Coleridge, who coined the phrase motiveless malignity and what may have been meant by that. We're going to look at the, um, the concept of motive. We're going to look at Diago as a vice character, Iago's motivations, what it actually means to cast Diago and how that might impact things, and thinking about how we view Iago in certain ways. So to begin with, um, the phrase motiveless malignity was coined by um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who was a um, romantic poet, um, who in his own annotations of his text, argued that Iago demonstrated a motiveless malignity. So a malignity is something evil. We talk about cancer being malign and things like that. So this idea of something that is just evil, that is eating away and corroding society. And what's particularly interesting is this idea that for Coleridge, he considered it to be motiveless. So this sense that Iago was evil to a certain extent, or was just bent on chaos and destruction and would look around trying to find a justification for it. So Iago has many motives within the play. And what our task is, is to question how convincing we find any of those, or whether or not we end up with a sense that Iago is going to behave like this come hell or high water. And what he has done is trying to find excuses and justifications for the things he wanted to do anyway. Many people take this to mean he didn't have a purpose in his villainy. I'm not sure I would agree with that. I think more what it means is that idea that there's almost something compulsive in Iago's um, villainy and he is a villain in search of a motive, perhaps might be a better way of thinking of it. Um, so it could be that Iago was motivated by his keen sense of intellectual superiority and his love of exerting power. And therefore, what he does is rationalise his determination to be the smartest guy in the room. Remember, he's not upper class, he's not powerful, he's not important, but he's very often, very clearly, the smartest person there. And that sense of frustration and injustice over the years perhaps has built up, and he wants to exert that. And what he does is rationalise it by coming up with a range of excuses. I think it's worth noting that Coleridge... As I say, this was his notes on his copy of Othello for preparation for a lecture he was going to give. Um, I don't know about you, but I quite frequently write notes that I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of hundred years later they were the basis of many people's essays um, in critical analysis of various Shakespearean works. So it is possible that Coleridge was working out an idea and didn't necessarily intend for it to become this sort of handy catchphrase. And therefore, we shouldn't just take it as a fate complete equally just because Coleridge said something and he was a smart guy doesn't mean that he was right. This is an interpretation. And I think the alliterative quality of the phrasing has turned it into something that a lot of people really latch on to, perhaps unnecessarily. Um, other people have obviously talked about Iago a lot over the years. Um, Stephen Greenblatt, who's a leading Shakespearean scholar, um, has commented that Iago represents the way concepts of identity modified from medieval notions of fixed identities to early modern notions of fluid ones. And I think that's quite interesting. We often talk about Othello as a play that starts to challenge the traditional versions of tragedy and turns it into something much more domestic, much more relatable. These aren't fates of nations involved. This is the fate of a marriage and stuff. And this is because at this time, there was a lot of transformation going on. And so Iago is able to manipulate people because they all have in their heads this fixed idea of him as honest Iago. Whereas what we see and what Shakespeare very clearly portrays is Iago can be whoever he wants to be, depending on who he's speaking to. And the character of Iago has lots of different faces, depending on what's going on. He's a very fluid character. Who Iago actually is, I would say, is incredibly hard to pin down, because even when he's talking to the audience in his soliloquies, and often we talk about those as moments where characters can be themselves, there is a sense with Iago that it's still a performance. He's playing us. 
so he's not talking to himself he is very demonstrably almost like a panto villain talking to the crowd and getting us involved and therefore even at those times he's playing a part and so who the actual character of Viago is in inverted commas probably the closest we get is in act five scene two when he's been exposed and he becomes this snarling angry quite reduced character he's not eloquent he's not impressive and so you get that sense of just how much he's been playing a part through the whole play Anthony Sher, who's um photographed there playing Iago in the globe a couple of years ago um, has this nice thing of he's angry with Samuel Coleridge. His analysis of Iago as a villain possessed by motiveless malignity is somehow lodged in the public consciousness, even though it's complete nonsense. So often the sort of stereotype for actors is this idea of what's my motivation? What am I trying to accomplish here? So for an actor, the idea that Iago has no motive would obviously be quite challenging um, and quite difficult. And so therefore, I think... I can perfectly well see an argument that Iago is a man overflowing with motive. He is angry at the world and he wants to bring it down. As Michael Caine so beautifully says in The Dark Knight, some men just want to watch the world burn. And I think there is an element of that for me when I watch Iago, where actually he feels like the whole world has done him wrong. And so he will go back at it and it can become almost that this is too big a motive and therefore feels motiveless but I think very much for when I watch Iago he seems to me like a man with a chip on his shoulder and he wants to redress the balance however he can but because he feels wronged in so many different ways it can feel almost like he's doing it without a really clearly defined purpose because it is not a focused villainy it is quite a sort of broad spectrum villainy because whatever he can attack he will so what we have to question then is what is actually the importance of motive and whether it matters if Iago has a good motive or not. And obviously, again, this then becomes very subjective. What counts as a good motive? And the start of the play, we talk about him being overlooked professionally and most of us be like, nah, he's not good enough. I think the argument of his sexual jealousy for a contemporaneous audience possibly may have carried more weight, possibly more amongst men than women. Um, and so... He may have a motive that we just don't think is good enough, perhaps. And it is important as to whether or not he has a motive. Traditionally, tragedies have this very clear moral. Othello is much harder to distill. Um, what, what is the moral of the story? Don't be jealous. Well, we seem to be working against basic human instincts. Um, Desdemona is killed largely because she makes a choice. So are we railing against female independence here? Um, and part of what makes Othello complicated in that morality is that Iago is plotting even before the play begins almost. And so there's not a clear inciting incident. There's not a clear and tidy narrative from A to B to C because Iago wants to hurt people and will figure out a way to do that. So arguably it is important that Iago has a good mo motive because of the dramatic satisfaction. We like nice and neat stories and I would say Othello to a large extent because it's a play very much about people and human nature lacks that clear narrative. It's a bit untidy because life is messy and people are messy and I think Shakespeare does a very good um, rendition of that in the play. There's also an argument that he becomes much scarier if he doesn't have a good motive. I think the bit where we're really supposed to lose sympathy with Iago is when for, the bit where I totally have to give him up is the scene where he's comforting Desdemona in Act 4 because she has done nothing. She is absolutely the innocent victim and he is able to stand on stage with her and comfort her knowing that he is the cause of all of her misery and effectively is helping to plan her death. So he becomes much more scary as a villain if he's prepared to see the deaths of anyone he fancies just to cause problems. So if he does lack a motive, that means that he could strike anyone at any time. And we like there to be a reason 
you know, when we're reading the newspaper reports of terrible crimes and things, we were always like, I wonder what made them do it. And if there isn't anything, that makes it a much scarier world to live in. Um, we also expect to see this in sort of a narrative but I think Shakespeare is actually quite often attempting to make this somewhat more real um, in a more domestic situation. And we want to believe that the people we encounter in our lives, in our marriages, in our workplaces, which is basically what this is, it's, you know, the status of these people heightens the consequences, but doesn't necessarily impact on their behaviours. We don't want to believe there's people in our world who could be bad for no reason. We don't want to believe there's people who we invite round for Sunday lunch who are perfectly capable of plotting our downfall. There's something very scary about that concept. Um, and so we want Iago to have a motive, to have a reason for doing this, because otherwise that creates some quite uncomfortable gaps in our own understanding of human nature. And I think... As I say, because Shakespeare is already sort of beginning to subvert that classical Aristotelian tragedy in so many ways, perhaps that's part of this. It doesn't have this nice, neat moral for us to follow. It doesn't have the snarling, panto-esque villain. It has someone who is utterly plausible, is very charming for a lot of the play, who is just able to use words. And I think that's the other thing that's really important to remember. Iago actually does very little in this play he talks a lot and he can we call this devastation with talking with manipulating a few scenes to talk to other people and fundamentally by planting a handkerchief and that's it so that again confronts us with quite a disturbing view of reality if that is what is all that is needed to wreak so much havoc Okay, moving on. Um, Iago can also be read as this vice character. Um, so vice was a popular stock character in medieval morality plays. So they were very simple plays which were travelled around the country to teach people um, moralistic and um, theological lessons. Um, and vice was very popular. He was the bad guy. He was the one that everyone was like, yeah, wonderful. And almost invariably, the longest single part was on intimate terms with the audience and is not subject to the limitations of other characters. Sound familiar? Iago is very similar to that, you know. Um, Iago is absolutely the flashiest character in this play and the one that for a long time is the most interesting. Um, and we almost end up with an argument that Iago is a metadramatic character. It's so almost that he's aware that he's weaving his inner story and his role in it and his way of manipulating the narrative. And he does that. He tells people stories and he plays on the cultural stories that everyone knows. You know, everyone knows women can't be trusted. Everyone knows about Venetian women. Everyone knows. Everyone knows. And he is able to manipulate that. He plays that part. And you see that so beautifully in, say, um, Act Two with the fight scene where he starts playing this drunken bluff soldier, you know, who's like one of the boys, and then is able to switch and then play the honest friend to Cassio, who desperately doesn't want to throw him under the bus, but will have the story dragged out of him because he's also a loyal servant of Othello. And he's playing roles very consciously all the way through. The Globe version of this one, um, with Tim McInerney playing Iago, I think in that scene particularly, is excellent for showing that, because he really see him transform in each moment, and how, even like with a quick look to the audience, you see him drop his character and then pick it back up again. So always thinking about how this is performed on the stage. Um, we have Othello's line from Act 5, I look down towards his feet, but that's a fable. Um, and that is arguably a specific reference to Iago as this vice-like character um, because vice was normally presented as having like cloven hooves and things like that and vice was often like in, um, interchangeable with something like the devil and temptation and things it represented sin and so for, in Othello's world Iago has become this vice, this temptation, this um, devilish character and he's literally saying to the audience 
look, it's almost as if he's got cloven hooves. Um, but what's interesting is that Shakespeare has inverted the traditional structures of the morality plays um, to explore ideas about society. Here, vice wants to maintain the status quo, where traditionally vice was the one who was coming in and trying to disrupt society and make people do new things. Iago actually kind of wants things to stay as they are. He wants the um, succession by the old gradation, so the next in line moves up instead of necessarily the best man for the job. There is clearly a resentment at times for Iago about Desdemona breaking um, the racial and the social bounds because that's not how it's supposed to work in her choice of a fellow. Um, and so here, rather, yes, Iago is still an agent of chaos, as Vice would have been. It's more petty and selfish. He is motivated by his own self-interest. Whereas in the traditional morality plays, Vice was almost like an agent of the devil who was there um, to just wreak havoc on the world. Um, and his existence was his motive. So that brings us back to that motiveless malignity thing. That idea that Vice didn't come down and something happened to him. His very presence meant that he was going to tempt people and try to disrupt their behaviours because that was who he was. What his behaviour and his personality are one and the same. So for, perhaps, therefore, Riago doesn't really need a motive. Um, and the audience perhaps accepts his malignity, his evil doing, because it's a necessary narrative device rather than a realistic response to events. How much are we expecting these characters to be real? You know, Shakespeare's a little ahead of his time on that one. Um, and what's also particularly interesting is that vice was normally represented as black, um, as was the devil. Obviously, this is pre-colour printing, much easier to show black and white. Whereas here we have this inversion of that where our vice character is almost always played by a white guy. Um, we also get the binary opposites, you know, is fairly traditional in this, you know, Star Wars, I'd say, does it beautifully with the light and the dark side. Um, so traditionally, it would have actually been Othello who was arguably that vice role. You can compare that to um, Aaron the Moor and Titus Andronicus. So there is a significance to making it a white Venetian in this play who is creating this sense of disruption and chaos. So here that we could argue that because it is this white Venetian, vice is actually embedded within this society rather than being this strange external visiting force who arrives to cause trouble. The trouble's already there. It's already embedded in the, in the society. So I think Shakespeare might be using this dramatic tradition to say some quite interesting things about the societal um, structure. So we also get this developed because normally in the old plays, Vice is othered somehow. He looks different, behaves differently somehow or other, but also has this wide ranging knowledge of the world. And to an, an extent, both of those apply to Iago. Iago feels like he's been overlooked, he's been made irrelevant, he feels othered and definitely tries to capitalise on his knowledge of the world and of people in order to achieve the chaos that he's trying to create. So let's have a look at Iago's motives now. So motive one, the one we get introduced to first, is professional jealousy where he is angry that Cassio has been given the promotion over him and he feels that he deserved it. He talks about how he had people petitioning on his behalf and he clearly blames Cassio for taking the job and also Othello for changing the rules. Okay, this idea that there is a way this is supposed to go that hasn't happened and so there's a sense that he is entitled to something he's missed out on and so both of them have to suffer. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting to ask because this comes out in act one scene one very early in the play how long has Iago been a bad guy? So we get right at the start Rodrigo complaining about Iago basically spending his money as if he's his own but he doesn't seem to have become a proper villain villain he's a bit dodgy until the scene, the ideas in the play. He has got a sterling repu reputation for honesty from almost everyone he meets. So was Cassio's appointment just the straw that broke the camel's back? Was that the thing that tipped him over the edge into proper villainy instead of maybe a bit of 
roguishness. We also have to question how long he's known Othello, because I think that makes a big difference on how we perceive his betrayal of Othello. And the opening of Act 1, Scene 2 suggests that they've worked each other, alongside each other for quite a long time. Um, and they talk, he talks about the different um, battles and campaigns they've been on and things like that. Which also has a knock on later on, because if they've been if they've known each other for a long time, it makes Othello's trust in him over his new wife, who remember that he's had to woo in secret. He doesn't know Desdemona very well. He didn't have a five year engagement. This has all happened very quickly. It suddenly makes his trust in Iago a bit more plausible, which Iago would know and capitalise on. But then also, um, which has been argued by people from um, many times, I got this from Crawford in 1916, who was writing and asked, did Othello first betray Iago's trust by refusing to follow the military conventions of the next man in line? And then we have to question, is that a good enough motivation? So arguably, Othello broke the trust first. He overlooked Iago. And if he overlooked Iago, then Iago might feel like he is entitled for his revenge. Obviously, we have a proportionality issue there. But when we're talking about whether or not Iago has this motiveless malignity, if he and Othello have known each other for a very long time. If Othello has seen his proof on the battlefield, as opposed to Cassio, who is dismissed here as a, a mere arithmetician, perhaps we could see that this is a bigger slight than perhaps we can contemplate at this point, and therefore a bigger motivating force in Iago's chaotic villainy. Then later in Act One, we get the revelation that I hate them all and it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he has done my office. So suddenly we're going from professional jealousy to sexual jealousy and he wants this revenge on Othello. And I think there's something really interesting in this because professional jealousy is something where you might say, look, get over it, you weren't the right man for the job. But this endemic fear of cuckoldry and this idea that sexual humiliation was the pinnacle of reputational humiliation for men in his society, it suddenly makes, I think, Shakespeare was trying to go, there is another reason why he's doing this. And I don't know, how, again, how much we're supposed to, how much stock we're supposed to give to this. Um, but this fear and this anger over female infidelity um, persists even to this day and is something that is when you see reporting in newspapers and things of women who've been attacked and murdered by their um romantic partners so often there's a you know oh he thought she was having an affair as if that's an excuse um and this idea that the pinnacle of humiliation was sexual for men it said you were less than a man that you were pathetic that you weren't um relevant anymore and there's also this suggestion that Iago may be perhaps a bit beyond his prime. Um, his age is quite fluent. It does say in the book that he's about, I think, 28 in the play. That he's about 28. But um, I think that's very adaptable depending on who's playing him. And generally, he's played older. And so it also makes sense that if he feels that he has been betrayed sexually and has been made a fool of by Othello, bedding his wife and again it's not entirely clear where this comes from it is thought abroad so is he more upset about the reputation the rumor or whether or not it's true is it really rumored abroad or is this something iago has sort of created in his own head um but it does make sense that he would go like for like this is very old testament an eye for an eye but suddenly we've got Desdemona in here where we're seeing already at the end of Act One, he is perfectly happy to destroy a woman um, or to ruin a reputation. You know, Cassio's a proper man, let me see now. Da, da, da. He's going, yeah, it's fine, I'll plot that Cassio and Desdemona are having an affair. Well, that would destroy Desdemona, even without the tragic outcomes of this play where she's murdered. Um if she's branded 
as a cheating wife, that would absolutely destroy her in most societies at this point. And he's perfectly happy to do that to this very innocent woman who he doesn't even know to get his own revenge. So we get that selfishness and that pettiness coming through. Um, and so I think there is some really interesting bits in this. And even whether or not he believes it's true, it's also worth noting at this point that he is not in, there's no indication that he's necessarily expecting people to die. Um, he is a man who's been consumed with jealousy. He isn't planning to kill anyone. His plan is to make them ridiculous and reduce them to his level and make them see the punishment that he's lived with. Um, it's the Othello who brings the violence and the sense of murderous rage into this in Act 3. Iago goes along with it, don't get me wrong, but Again, at this point, it still seems more he's determined to create chaos than the bloodbath that we get at the end of the play. And then we move on to a couple of odd little bits in um, to do with the sense of sexual jealousy with Cassio. Um, increasingly, as I study this play, I am unconvinced about this. So towards the end of this um, soliloquy from Act 2, um, he talks, I'll have our Michael Cassio on the hip, abuse him to the moor in the rank garb, for I fear Cassio in my nightcap too. Make the moor thank me, love me and reward me for making him egregiously an ass. So firstly, I think there's his full determination. What he wants to do is make is humiliate the moor. He doesn't want him to die. He wants him to be a figure of fun, which is what Iago thinks he is to other people if his wife has been... Um, playing around behind his back. But this idea here that for I fear Cassio with my nightcap too, the more versions of this I've seen, it's played about 50-50 from the ones I've been able to find as to whether or not he is saying, oh, I think Cassio has been sleeping with Amelia as well, or whether it's almost like he's working out a plan and like almost practicing him being an ally. So as if he's rehearsing when he's going to um, reveal this to Othello and then they say, oh, yeah, well, Cassio's got a reputation because I, well, I think he might have been off with my wife as well. And whether or not that's part of him rehearsing what he's going to say um, is quite complicated. And again, I think that comes down to the drama and the way it's performed on the stage. We also get this line earlier on. Um, now, I do love her too. Not out of absolute lust, though, per adventure, I stand accountant for his greater sin but partly led to die at my revenge, for that I do suspect the lusty moor hath leaked into my seat. Um, so suddenly we've got this idea of he is somewhat sexually unfaithful. He's declaring his love for Desdemona. Um, and he's saying, you know, don't get me wrong, I really do fancy her. But also, I'd really like to get one over on Othello. So even his sexual appetites are sort of dominated by Othello and this playing into this very destructive stereotype of this sexualized black man who is going to steal your women um but there's also this perhaps jealousy of othello's ability to seduce a young desirable woman when um iago is a long married man um and this frustration again of him being past his prime his life passing him by and also we get that exposure of the double standard where he seems almost happy where he could be evened with him wife for wife so he's going well if i can bed desdemona then i'll know that i've got one over on othello so he's allowed to sleep around but not amelia um but also the idea of desdemona is purely a tool in his jealousy um regarding othello and so you get this complexity of this character and this difficulty in where exactly we're supposed to fall on this um, and we have to question how far the audience can follow all of these new motives. Every time he talks to us, there's a new justification for what he's doing, a new rationality. And at some point, we have to start going, hold on, why is it you're doing this? Too many motives becomes as suspicious as none at all. And we go along with Iago because he's funny, he's highly entertaining, he talks to us, he's formed that relationship with us. But Shakespeare increasingly demonstrates that he can't be trusted and that he is quite irrational. 
And it almost makes us complicit in the devastation that this dangerous character is wreaking because he's telling us everything he's planning to do and then we let him do it. And we know these aren't good enough reasons. We know that the motivations are pretty slim. But still, because he's funny and because he's entertaining, he causes the most interest, we sort of go along. And the comedy of the initial scenes is already beginning to give way to tragedy with us as co-conspirators. And so Shakespeare is very carefully bringing his audience in. We almost become part of this play almost more than in any other of his, um, except in maybe the Falstaff ones, because Iago brings us in. Iago makes us part of it in a way that we're not normally. And then we get to this incredibly uncomfortable comment in Act 5. So this is just before this, the fight between Rodrigo and Cassio, which Iago has engineered. And at this point, we should hopefully, our sympathies with Iago should be rupturing, as I say, mind disappearing in Act 4 when he's um, comforting Desdemona. But I think here, suddenly we get a really ugly side to Iago and that honesty starts to really come through in a way where the justifications of earlier in the play suddenly become very suspect when this is how he's justifying this behaviour. So when he's just trying to destroy people's reputations, he's evoking professional and sexual jealousy and things that we can all perhaps relate to. And we might go, oh, well, we wouldn't go that far, but I'll kind of see where he's coming from. Here, he says... Live Rodrigo, he calls me to a restitution large of gold and jewels I have bobbed from him as gifts to Desdemona. It must not be. So saying, I'm going to have to kill, Rodrigo's going to have to die because otherwise he's going to expose the fact I've been stealing from him. If Cassio do remain, he hath a daily beauty in his life that makes me ugly. So he's jealous because Cassio's fitter than he is and gets more girls. Suddenly, these become very base, reductive, disagreeable motives. These are motives that are calculated to be unsympathetic for the audience. And so he has this resolution that now whether he kill Cassio or Cassio him or each do kill the other, each way makes my gain. So he's suddenly talking about the deaths of men in this very casual way that just however it's going to suit him which really should be alienating to the audience. And at this point, we really should be seeing the ugliness of this character who we've kind of encouraged and been entertained by and allowed to do all of these things. And then suddenly we're confronted with this really uncomfortable reality because we need to be entirely alienated from him and have that true villainy revealed without any ambiguity so that hurtling into the final scene we're in no doubt of just how appalling he is and therefore that anything he has done is a truly villainous act. Um, there's some really wonderful writing about Iago out here and like, there's some links at the end. I would recommend going onto the British Library website and looking at Othello. There's some excellent articles in there. Um, this one was written by Ryan in 2016 and talks about how the tragic sequence of events is triggered by the elopement of Othello and Desdemona. The fact they are obliged to elope makes the illicit nature of their relationship in the eyes of Venice immediately clear. Remember, Iago is a representative of that Venetian society who we may presume would not approve. But in their eyes and in Shakespeare's, there's nothing illicit about their love to which they regard themselves and the play regards them as fully entitled. Undeterred by the paternal wrath and widespread disapproval they're bound to incur, Othello and Desdemona act as if a black man from Africa and an upper-class white woman from Venice have every right to fall in love, marry and be left to live happily ever after. They act, in other words, as if they were already free citizens of a truly civilised future, instead of prisoners of a time when racial prejudice and sexual inequality are so ingrained that even their heroic hearts are tainted by them. So I think there's a really interesting argument here that... Iago could almost be seen as trying to reassert social norms, whereby they have transgressed the social contract that was in existence at that time, and he is trying to re-establish the correct way of being, in inverted commas. And we get this question of, does he need more motivation than that? And the play, remember, makes him the villain. So we're supposed to see that him attempting to reassert these social norms is not a thing we're supposed to support. And so we're left with that uncomfortable 
challenge to our attitudes where we might cut particularly at the time it was performing, there may be people in that audience who are kind of agreeing that they don't think this is okay, but that puts them on the side of the villains. And no one wants to think of themselves as the villain. So Shakespeare is really forcing the audience to confront their own prejudices in that. So Othello and Desdemona find unleashed upon them in the shape of Iago, this venomous rage of a society whose foundations are rocked by the mere fact of their marriage. So we have to question whether or not Iago represents general society, and we compare that to perhaps the Duke's attitudes and his seeming to not be that concerned about this marriage, or is he just representing the worst in society? And is representing the worst in society enough to cause such damage? Now, 10 years ago, I might have said no, but looking around us today, it's possible that we can see how the worst in society, when given a voice and given an outlet, can create far more havoc than we might have expected. And then we get onto this idea of the social contract for his job. So as that's been passed over for promotion by the more in favour of Cassio and contempt of loyal service and the right of precedence of old gradation wasn't outrageous and insulting enough, Othello and Desdemona have made a mockery of the principles of social, sexual and racial hierarchy on what Giago's very identity and sense of self-worth depend. So he hatches a plot and tells a tale designed to put them in their place, to turn the divine Desdemona into the subtle whore he thinks every woman really is, and to turn the noble, eloquent Othello into a deranged wife killer, who proves the racist's worst fears fully justified. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the idea that Iago arguably sees himself in the story, and he doesn't like the changes and wants to put everyone back in their place. And his motives seem, his um, plans seem to do that. Again, whether or not this is conscious or whether this is something that's quite a lit is a different thing. Um, but we get this sense that he is, as we would refer to today, the model of male entitlement. He deserves a wife who is dutiful, but he deserves his own sexual liberation. He deserves the job because he was the next one waiting. He feels he's earned Cassio's place purely because of the old gradation where each step second stood heir to the first. But we then get Othello with this more modern idea of promoting who he thinks is the right person for the job rather than just knocking on the, the door of the next one in line. So Othello explicitly rejects these social conventions by promoting Cassio. And so arguably, Iago is trying to teach him a lesson and reassert the social inertia by saying, no, 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 you follow the rules of our society or you don't get to play. And then again, when you add the racial um, film over that, it creates an extra impression of exactly how powerful the embedded entrenched attitudes were and how hard it may be to start overturning them remember this play comes from the early 1600s these are still conversations we're having today 400 years later the iago that we see at the end of the play in act five scene two is very different to an iago that we see at any other point um and you get this where they have captured him they're calling him this demi devil and iago for the first time, shuts up. Demand me nothing, what you know, you know. From this time forth, I never will speak a word. Which is true. And I think it's really interesting that Shakespeare denies both the characters on stage and his audience a proper explanation. We're used to that villain monologue, you know, you get it in detective stories and all sorts of things where you go, it's a fair cop, I will now explain myself. Iago refuses to do that. He's not going to give you that narratively satisfying conclusion of justifying himself. He clearly feels actions speak louder than words and that he's said enough. And I think there's something really powerful in that, where Iago, who has been by far and away the most chatty um, participant in this entire play, suddenly shuts down because words are power. And the only power he can assert at this point is a refusal to satisfy their curiosity. And I think particularly that phrase, what you know, you know, where it suggests each of them knows what they did to upset him and they know the part they played, so he shouldn't have to explain himself. 
And if he's simply acting as part of the male psyche of this frustrated ambition and, je and sexual jealousy, then you could interpret that to mean they already know why he did it, because almost the argument might be that they would have done the same, whether or not that's true. Iago clearly thinks that may be true. And the transformation in this character at this point, look at this compared to Act 1 and 2, where he's taking pains to explain himself, certainly to us, and he's so eloquent and charming. And then he becomes this mute, malevolent force on the stage at the very end and refuses to give that satisfying conclusion to everyone. So we could argue that Iago is in fact far from motiveless and malign. He could be argued to be a mirror image of the other men in the play, exploiting their fears of women, sexuality, social class, changing conventions and race, where he is considers himself almost better than them because he's prepared to act in a way that they will not. And again, it might come down to we argue that he seems motiveless because we would like a better motivation than I just don't like how the world works right now. Because fundamentally, with Iago, he feels the world owes him something and he's going to do what he can to get that debt paid. And so we end up with something where we're quite, we, want, we would like something more than that, because most of us end up at a time where the world doesn't work quite how we'd like it to. But we don't go this far. But perhaps Shakespeare's saying, well, maybe this is in all of us if we're not careful. Now, obviously, the casting of Iago is really important to how he's portrayed on stage. And the way that he's cast with um, Othello as well is quite important. So how old Iago is really matters. Um, so the Tim McInerney version of the Globe has this sense of someone who is past their best. And Cassio comes on and he's so much smarter and suave. And you can see why there would be jealousy there. Um, the Rory Kinnear version, he's very much cast as a contemporary of um, Othello. And you get that sense of a dynamic and where they've been through tough times and have seen the worst and are able to pick each other up. And he plays on that. Um, we also have to ask about race. Obviously, go and read the Hugh Quashie stuff that he's written. Um, again, that's on the British Library website where he's talked about what really convinced him to play Othello, which was a role he had been reluctant to play, was the casting of a black Iago, or part of what convinced him to do it. Because suddenly you then get this quite complex idea, and a lot of people argue about whether or not Iago is racist. Personally, for the actual text, for me, I think Iago just capitalises on whatever he can. So he uses racism when the character he's talking to that's a lever that will work with them. So he used it with Rodrigo and Brabantio, but he uses different things elsewhere. However, if we're looking at this as the idea that he is angry about the social conventions having been broken, then arguably there is a racist aspect to that. Um, and the way that this was portrayed in the RSC version um, of the Hugh Quashie Othello was almost as if Iago was angry at Othello for going outside his own race and that it was almost a betrayal to have married a white woman which was quite an interesting dynamic. Um, the interpretation of this character goes far beyond the words on the page. The way that he behaves towards Othello, the way that he behaves on stage is really key. The Rory Kinnear one I think is superb because it's got this simmering anger all the way through so the scene when they first arrive in Cyprus and he's sort of having that chat with Desdemona and the jokes about sort of various bawdy things in that version you can see that it's creating discomfort and he actually sort of has to remember to play a part because it's like he was getting a bit too honest for a second whereas the Tim McInerney one is constantly winking to the audience and showing the jokes and the laughs that he's having at people's expense. So always talk about Iago as a three-dimensional character. He is not simply the words he says, it's how he behaves, how he interacts, and the way that he behaves towards other cast members and the audience. Now, what's also key is that Iago keeps 
developing. So Thompson wrote in 2017, it is instructive to note that Othello does not exist in one historical moment or one historical context alone. It does not merely come out of and reflect the early 17th century. Rather, it is a play whose stagings, readings and meanings have mutated and evolved over time. The Othello that we read or see in the 21st century is not the same that Shakespeare's audience read or saw in early modern England, or that slave owners saw in the 19th century America, or that Afrikaners saw in apartheid South Africa. So I think, again, this is really important because Othello is about people and these quite universal, timeless attitudes of who gets to fall in love with who and how society is supposed to be set up and things. Each society brings their own values and their own issues to the play. Um, and so that means Iago is always going to be interpreted differently. So Coleridge's motiveless malignity that he saw a couple of hundred years ago may be just as reasonable as my interpretation of Iago as this epitome of male entitlement and sexual jealousy and the destructive force of that, because that's so relevant in our society today. Whereas when Coleridge is writing in the Romantic period and you just see the world changing around you so rapidly and people being so angry at how the world was changing and mutating, you can see how it would seem much more undirected because the concept of male entitlement and toxic masculinity was still a couple of hundred years away. So one view can be perfectly reasonable because Othello is a play that changes that each audience brings its own context to. So, as promised, these are some things you ought to go and um, read or watch. Um, there's also an excellent podcast series from Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. The latest series has been all about race and Shakespeare and things like that, which plays quite interestingly into our discussion of um, Othello and the Argo. Um, but hopefully that's been of use to you to try and look at some of the bigger ideas surrounding the Argo and try and get you out of a uh, microscopic focus into looking at the broader functions of this character and what Shakespeare may have been attempting to do with him.